Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, back with another conversation episode. Today I had on returning guest, Megan Cleveland, who is just so flippin' lovely and loves Thebes as much as I do. And I mean, (laughs) what more could I ask for? Megan came on to talk about not only Thebes, but also that cursed family of Oedipus and his, you know, sibling children. (sighs) Megan has written a YA retelling about Ismene, the daughter of Oedipus, and so I was thrilled to have her back on the show to talk all about that because I love Thebes. But I also love the idea of YA Greek myth retellings um, because, I mean... There's so many retellings now, and, and they're all lovely, um, but I feel like there's not a lot of YA, and maybe it's that I'm not paying as much attention to YA, but maybe it's just because there's a lack. And if if the story of a girl who finds out that her father is actually her brother, and her mother is actually her grandmother also, they're both, you know, if that isn't fit for a YA novel, I, I don't know what is. This episode also features probably some of the hardest I've ever laughed into the microphone um, for similar reasons uh, to the whole Oedipus of it all. I'm going to let you uh, wait not so patiently for that moment. It was such a joy talking to Megan and hearing all about this book. And yeah, I hope you all sit back and enjoy this uh, love letter to Thebes in the form of a conversation about a novel. (laughs) Conversations, novelizing the best ancient city-state. Riddles of the Sphinx with Megan Cleveland. I would love to hear about your book and and Thebes and like I know I'm only saying Thebes I reckon it's about specific people in Thebes but you know me I just fucking love Thebes so yeah I know (laughs) so I just want to hear everything but yeah tell me about your you know whatever you want to share about your characters and your novel and uh. sure so I wrote a little introduction just to remind people who I am because yes it's been a while since they heard from me so my name's Megan Cleveland I have a BA in classical studies and classical languages from the University of Guelph and an MA in classics from the University of Western Ontario and since graduating I decided to pursue my lifelong dream of becoming an author using my knowledge of classical history literature and archaeology to adapt classical myths for young adults And I'm so happy to talk to you about my upcoming self-published book on the podcast. Literally, I was rewriting this book, um, I don't know, two or three years ago and listening to your podcast and thinking, wouldn't it be so great if I could talk to Lev? And here we are. So this is like (laughs) such a good moment. So I love it because like YA too. I mean, I know there's some YA. Well, there's definitely a lot, but like, I feel like a lot of them are adult and, and like, there's also this habit of like calling adult books that are written primarily for women calling them YA so I also love to have one that is like no no this is YA like because there there should be YA too and also we should not call all books written for women YA it's a great distinction (laughs) I've always loved YA and I think a lot of Greek myths really lend themselves well to that sort of genre because it's a lot about self-discovery and finding out who you are and like family secrets so I think it really works out for for young people Speaking of family secrets, though, like, I also think you have, like, the best character for YA and, but also family secrets. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I'll just give a little uh, description of the book before I start ranting about it. (laughs) Please. So (laughs) in Riddles of the Sphinx, Ismene, the daughter of the legendary Oedipus, refuses to be a background character in the tragedy of her family. Ismene makes a wager with Apollo, the god who cursed her family, agreeing to go into his service if she cannot stop the war between her brothers. Ismene must travel all across ancient Greece to learn the source of her family curse and try to break it before war severs her family forever. But In a family at war with itself, is she destined to be the only survivor? I mean, well, mythologically, we got some stuff (laughs) to say. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love that. I mean, 
like just all the all the families in Thebes obviously are my favorite, but like I just love the story of like the line of Oedipus so much. I feel like there is it's so interesting because our primary, you know, sort of the most famous source is like Sophocles, right? But like we don't know what he was changing from the myths that he was working off of because we don't really have what came before him, which I'm just kind of obsessed with when it comes to this myth because it was huge. It was so important. And yet, like, all we have is this play, which, as people know, it's just like movies adapting history. Like, we don't know what they changed. Like, there's a Napoleon movie out right now, and I bet you it's bonkers. So, yeah. like, yeah, like, Sophocles could be wild. Like, so, I mean, <laughs> this is me. Like, I also, you know, focus on the myths obviously but i'm so curious kind of how you wanted to work with that you know given the sourcing and like what you wanted your characters to be like in their story and like yeah like what were your goals and thoughts and schemes and whatever <laughs> i don't know how to form questions well i just answer like end up finishing them in the most bizarre ways that is the perfect question though because <laughs> it has been such a journey to get from where i started to where it is now um i first started writing the book in uh 2017 for NaNoWriMo. And I, um, I went on a trip in June and I read the song of Achilles. Mm. And that was just like mm -hmm. life defining moment, for not real. just because the writing's so beautiful, but I looked at Madeline Miller's bio and I was like, this could be me. I could be doing this. Why aren't I doing this? So then I thought I could write a Greek myth retelling myself. So I sat down and thought about it. And during, um, uh, undergrad and grad school, one of the myths that you keep reading over and over and over is Oedipus the King and Antaeity. <laughs> so like, I know those back to front. So I thought, okay, I can work with those. So I started um, the process of writing by just rereading those plays. And I also uh, reread Statius's The Biad, which I talked about in our last episode together, yeah. which I read in grad school. And I read the translations and like parts in the original Greek and Latin just to like get a vibe for it. And um, this is kind of funny, but when I started out, I was going to write the book from Antigone's point of view, but I don't actually like Antigone very much. Same. She's kind of a bitch, but you know? I don't think she's just like so overrated. Like I don't like to say that about a woman, but I think that Antigone is the perfect example of that. Like because I think, I think that Antigone is kind of like she gives me like kind of like Athena vibes. Like I feel like she has become so big because she fits into the patriarchy in a way that makes men comfortable, and so she became this like big woman of myth. But like, yeah, I mean, comparative, comparatively uh, to like everybody else, she's a lot less interesting. Like, I love working with the other sister, the forgotten and sister. That's such a good point you just made, because it is a woman, the perfect woman written by a man. So that's why we don't like her. <laughs> yeah, that's but, the uh, thing. <laughs> so then I thought, OK, Antigone has her own play. Achilles and Polynices have their own thing. But what about Ismene? She just kind of gets mentioned. She doesn't have her own story. So I thought, what's her story? So uh, the first round of writing that I did, I was really like focused on trying to make it as historically accurate as possible, which now <laughs> I think, what a stupid idea that was. But I really wanted to like capture this Bronze Age Greece and have all of these like archaeological details and like try to make it as true to the history as I knew it. But like, we know that in Greek history, you place they place a lot of limits on um, the rights and movements of women. So no. a lot, <laughs> a lot of my <laughs> feedback was, she's the main character, but she's not very um, active, or she's not doesn't really have any agency. So I thought, okay, well, this is true to Greece at the time, but they were <laughs> right. And um, one of the ways I tried to get around that was by having her be a seer. So she could mm -hmm. see the events unfolding as they happened through her dreams, but not actually be participating in them. And this is going to come up again later. So we're going to remember is me as a seer. And so I wrote that book, tried to make it as historically accurate as I could, sent it out to people to read. They sent me their feedback. I fixed it, sent it out to agents, got rejected. And then I took a writing class, workshopped it. And then um, I got to go to this writing festival called the uh, Fold Festival of Literary Diversity in Brampton. I 
I know people, well, I used to know people who started that, I think, like I, because when I was working in book publishing, I remember that starting up. That's so exciting. Yeah, it's a really, really great um, festival, especially for like marginalized writers. You can go and uh, talk to people in the industry. And I got to speak to a literary agent there. And she told me the problem with the book, which um, my friends had been too nice to tell me. And <laughs> the problem was... She said it so in a way that made so perfect sense to my neurodivergent brain, That's where so she helpful. said, you're, I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to write a Greek myth, but what you want to do is write in response to it. And Ooh. I thought, oh, that makes, yeah, you're right. That's what I want to do. So from that point, I scrapped the 75,000 words that I already wrote and wrote it from the beginning. And this time I was like, screw historically accurate. Like if my audience is young adults, they're not going to know all this. It's not my colleagues from grad school, my professors reading this. This is going to be teenagers and they want to read something fun. So when I started out, I thought, what got me into classics in the first place? And that, like a lot of people, was Disney's Hercules, Damn which right. is just such a fun, colorful, magical, funny movie. And that's what draws a lot of people to to Greek um, mythology is just like the magic and the monsters and, and the gods in their relationships to humans. So that's what I wanted to focus on. And one part of the first draft of the book was it started out with um, all of Oedipus's children when they're very young and when the plague first falls on Thebes. So they watch Oedipus try to figure out who the murderer of Laius is, and they play a game where they try to figure it out. And people really liked that. And um, the agent even did. And she said, but um, it would have been cool if you kept that for the whole book. And I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So in this version, the finished version, Ismini doesn't know um, what happened to her parents. She thinks they're both dead. And she doesn't know everything that happened. Mm -hmm. So she goes on this journey to uncover the truth about her family and the curse on her, on her line and how that's um, attributing to the generational violence with her brothers. So I really took, <laughs> I really um, copy pasted of that paper I wrote for grad school, but made it a novel <laughs> about um, cursed families in Greece and how when she travels throughout Greece, she gets uh, hints about her own family curse along the way. So does that mean you we sorry now I'm in my favorite cursed family mode. So, do you talk about like the never even know which one to call it because they're so cursed. Um but you know the Thyestes family? Yes. Hell there's yeah. <laughs> So these there's a scene with Thyestes and I took a lot of inspiration from Lord of the Rings. Fuck um, yes. <laughs> yes. You know the part in the two towers where they go to Rohan and Theoden is kind of being hidden behind Grima Wormtongue. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that moment Thyestes is on his little throne and he's like, why are you here, Tyrusius? So it's, I took some inspiration from Tolkien for that. <laughs> I'm loving that I can absolutely see Theoden, Thyestes. Like there's, yeah, there's like, there's something there. I love it. <laughs> I, I will give you a hint, but I'll try to make it as vague as possible for people who end up reading the book. Um, before I had them come to um, Mycenae after the events of a certain feast, but I decided it would be more uh, emotional if it had, if they were there at the feast. So it gets a bit, my sister read it and went, this is gross. It's awesome. So hopefully people like it. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's, I love one of my favorite things about retellings and when people do this is and what I'm trying to do on my own is like incorporating lots of little mythological references throughout, like whether they are long and detailed or they're just little bits and pieces because like there's so much and they're so interconnected and like how fun to have things that, you know, can be obvious, like the, th the feast of Thyestes, which I, Seneca's Thyestes might be my favorite thing in the world now. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, or, or like, little tiny little easter eggs where somebody's like hey that name is interesting or that like vague reference is interesting like why don't i look it up and then they learn this whole new myth like especially excuse me especially for ya like that's so great it's such a great introduction for people to find other other books as well you know or other mythology mm -hmm. and like i love that so like was 
I, I want to make sure I let you talk about all of the things you want to talk about, but like, were there, did you do a lot of that? Did you, you know, seek to, to kind of like include a lot of little myths or were you more focused on the, the larger story? So, uh, the first version of the the book, I had a lot of little myths where they, they tell each other stories because there oh. was a, a subplot of her weaving this, this tapestry of all the stories her brother told her before he turned kind of evil. But, um, <laughs> but in this, um, she doesn't really know things. She kind of uncovers them along the way and she actually right. has to meet the people. So <clears throat> on her journey, the first place she goes to is Argos and she gets to meet, um, Adrastus, who's the king of Argos at the time, and that's where her brother Polynices is. He doesn't recognize her because she's uh, doing a Mulan and is dressed as a boy at the time. Love but that. Um, <laughs> she she learns about um, Tantalus while she's there because Tantalus is um, the famous ancestor of Adrastus, and he makes a really big deal out of it. And she's like, "Why? He's a terrible guy. You don't want to be associated with him." So she she learns along the way about. Um, problems between fathers and sons and brothers and oh how does this apply to my own family I don't know <laughs> yeah I love that because that's the thing about mythology or Greek mythology like it is so it, cyclical and also like it, it mirrors so many other different things like yeah like these these family curses and then the fathers and relationships but I love that, that you had that reference to Tantalus because one of my favorite things about reading about that family which is just my favorite curse in the world is that no matter how horrifying like the next bit is in that cursed line, they're always like, we are the children of Tantalus. Did he try to eat his son? Sure. Are we still proud to be the yes. children of Tantalus? Like, hell yeah. And then it's like, Agamemnon and Menelaus are like, we are the sons of Atreus. And it's like, did Atreus kill his nephews and feed them to his brother? Sure. We are the <laughs> proud sons of Atreus. Like, I just love that it's like we will learn no lessons. We will always honor our fathers no matter what they did. Like it just, yeah, it feels so legit. <laughs> That's so funny. There's a part in um, uh, Statius's The Biad, which is partially based on, where Polynices actually has some self-awareness and he doesn't want to tell people who his father is because he's Ooh. he's embarrassed. He, he doesn't want to be associated with that stigma. So, I think that Oedipus is the one that, it, yeah, there is. I it's kind of worse than just yeah. eating your son, I guess. I but like you think like we think about it now, and you're like, which one's worse? Like I don't think that 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 Oedipus's situation is inherently worse. But I love that, yeah. Like in the ancient world, it was like, no, we we're not proud to be the children of Oedipus. But like Atreus, Thyestes, or like Atreus or or Tantalus, like that's totally fine. Like I love that there was this line of like, well, but he married his mom. It's like <laughs> you sacrificed babies and fed them to his son like which is worse really yeah i think a part of it also is like atreus and thyestes were very aware of what they were doing to each other yes. so that and oedipus he didn't know about yeah. his own parentage so it's kind of a different situation for him so yeah it's, it's a bit interesting that he has to, he kind of has more guilt because he didn't kind of talk himself out of what he was gonna do like atreus i know and it's it's just interesting because it's like to us that would make him so much less guilty he had no idea he was marrying his mother mm -hmm. but meanwhile it's like no that's the embarrassment not these guys <laughs> that did horrible things very on purpose oh it's just that's so it's so interesting sorry like i'm like this is what happens with these ones is that i just go to the mythology and i'm like oh my god but you just pointed out something interesting about all these random myths that is not uh, necessarily the purpose of of your novel <laughs> but <laughs> no 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 i think it's important like a lot of those myths have in common is um with cannibalism in these myths <laughs> I I it's such a weird I thing love to say Greek mythology to just be you can just so cleanly be like with cannibalism and i'm like mm -hmm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's perfectly normal topic but it's it's kind of symbolically this is a similar situation to oedipus it's like the image of the ouroboros a snake eating mm. its tail if you eat your children they're going back to where they came from and you're you're ending your own line so that's what's so happening you with your both. mom like it's the same kind of it's the same thing you're yeah. going back to where you came from literally yeah. <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That might be one of my all-time favorite podcast moments. <laughs> you going back to where you came from? Oh, 
That's what Freud says, but whatever. No, you're you're not wrong. You are not wrong. <laughs> So, okay, that's, I mean, that's the literal perfect transition because, like, you're you're writing this YA book about this girl and, like, you know, I, I know you probably want to watch with too many spoilers, but, but, like, you're writing this YA book about a girl discovering her family, but the end discovery is that, like, her dad is also her brother and her mom is also her grandmother. Like, like how did you want to navigate that? Like, how much did you want to kind of you know make it for a younger audience or like you know what like what was your thought process there because you it's a lot <laughs> it is a lot I, for a long time I was like should I just gloss over the incest I do mention it like you have to because That's it's a very famous story but she's not so much focused on the incest as much as her family um like the curse of her her dad committing uh, patricide and how that kind of stained his relationships with his son and then her brothers are going to go on to commit fratricide. So she sees, um, especially through all of these other cursed families, um, how all of these conflicts between fathers and sons and brother and brother, how it could lead to violence. And she kind of wants to to take those lessons and change what happens. But yeah, it was it was really hard to to try to like talk about incest in a in a YA book, which is probably why all these agents were like, "Oh, no thanks." But <laughs> but I do like my my least favorite thing about Greek mythology retellings is when and when people just feel the need to like pretend that that the myth is like much more sanitized than it was, you know? Yeah. Like like the the truth the myth is there, but I also think it's really also realistic to have his meaning be more focused on the the patricide because like, you know, for for all it's horrible, like I mean, m- my favorite theory on on Oedipus and Jocasta collectively is that is that the tragedy isn't so much the like the actual marriage and and incest the tragedy is that they didn't know and that like in my head they were really happy family yeah and then this shit came out and so I, I like that because I like to think that that a daughter wouldn't you know and stop me if if this changes and you don't want me to say it but like I like the idea that that the daughter if she found that out wouldn't immediately like d- find her parents disgusting you know like it's just like that shit happened and like yeah it, I don't think it has to color you know your relationship with your parents despite it being kind of wild to think about yeah i tried to explore that more in the first version but in this one i'm like you know what there's a war going on they're literally gonna kill each other tomorrow so she's (laughs) like okay i gotta focus on the more important part which is breaking the curse let's not think about my mom and dad or brother or whatever he is let's just keep going (laughs) yeah and that's reasonable dude that's that's practical if you've got your brothers right outside your window and it's just a lot of, it's just not fair. I think that's what she kind of thinks is like her, her current generation's being pu- punished for what her father did. Her father's being punished for what his father did. So there's just these cycles of violence and when does it stop? So that's what she's trying to to achieve is trying to um, change that that course of fate from happening because we don't want to keep reliving all these cycles of violence just because they happened before. Yeah, well, and if, you know, there's really good examples of of the family, you know, like Thyestes, like it just goes on and on and on. Like I, I just yesterday the, had, the, had the last episode in my series on Iphigenia among the Taurians, which is like, you know, some of the, the final blows of that family and their curse and like just the absurd things that keep happening because, yeah, no one no one's trying to break it. So I love the idea of being like, if I don't stop this like it will just go on forever and so you know do what I can kind of thing there's a part in the book where she's at the feast and Atreus is kind of bustling around and he's all excited to have the feast get ready (laughs) we know why but she doesn't and she's kind of taking this as like oh this is great look at these brothers reconcile maybe I can learn from them and help reconcile my own brothers so when she finds out what Atreus had done she's so angry and she has this conversation with Apollo about it 
because she's like, they had the chance to just to end this feud, but it's just going to keep going. Is this what it's going to happen to my family? So, yeah. But of course, the gods, they can't tell you what, what to do. You have to figure it yourself. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, they wouldn't anyway. But no. Good, right? They're big dicks. So, great. Speaking of the gods, did you, I mean, with this family, it's not, you know, it's not really necessary. Um, But did you include, like, that aspect of mythology that's more like a direct kind of connection with the divine? Or, the, you know, what did you want to do with the gods? Right. So, okay, here's where it gets a little interesting. Great. So, in my first version, I had decided that Ismene should be a seer because of plot reasons. <laughs> and I, I started out with her. Um, she hears Apollo's voice in her mind, but she doesn't know it's Apollo. It's just this voice telling her what to do. And she's like, just leave me alone. So he makes her um, leave the women's quarters, which she's never done before. Because in this version of Thebes, um, she's told by her nurse and... Um, her brothers, that the plague is still ongoing and it's not safe to go outside. So this voice leads her outside and she realizes that it is safe. And what else are they lying to me about? And she soon realizes that the voice is Apollo and that he'll give her more answers if she goes to uh, Delphi to meet him. And it just so happens that the Thebans are going to go to Delphi for the Pythian games. So this is where she gets the idea to do a Mulan and join the delegation as a boy um, to watch her cousins and her brothers participate. And um, are they a kid? (laughs) Uh, I didn't explicitly say, but (laughs) we can, we know that the the Greek athletes were naked. So you can, in your head canon, they could be naked. Perfect. I saw a good meme today where it's just like all adaptations are like they're they're there's not enough clothes. dicks. I've seen yeah. that same one. Yeah, <laughs> there's not enough dicks. This is not real ancient Greece. <laughs> so, so while she's there, she meets the Oracle at Delphi, and um, a lot of uh, people who study Greek myth know Oracle Delphi is the most famous oracle in ancient Greece, but it's not the only one. Mm. Um, some of the others, like that we know of are uh, the Oracle at Dodona for Zeus. But it turns out um, in my second round of writing, I decided to do a deep dive into all of the history of Thebes, even though I wasn't trying to stay as historically accurate. I wanted that image of what Thebes was like in my head. Mm-hmm. And I discovered that there was an Oracle in Thebes to the god Apollo Ismenius. Oh yeah, like, there was an oracle because I know of like there's a temple to Apollo as menace because of the like stream that ran by. Yeah, called that. But oh, there was a whole god. oracle dedicated by the stream, and I, yeah. I kind of explain it in the book. The stream is Menius is named for a son of Apollo. He had a son with a nymph there. There's actually a poem about it by Pindar, um, and Pindar tells us a lot about um, the oracle at. Uh, Apollo is Menius as well mm-hmm. because he was a proud Theban. But um, they, this oracle was famous for telling the future through pyromancy, so they would look into the fire. So it's like, what the <laughs> fuck? So I reread um, Sophocles, and there's all these little like hints that I had did not noticed because I didn't know this before. Um, so when um, Tiresias goes to give his prophecies, he doesn't just deliver them, he looks into the fire, even though he doesn't have eyes, he looks into the fire because that's that. Um, association with um, the city, right? And there's a beautiful line um, from the Robert Fagel's translation where he says, um, where the embers glow and die and Apollo sees the future and the ashes. And I was like, okay, this is important. So I kind of wanted Ismene as a seer being a precursor to this oracle being set up, which isn't really historical, but I'm just just throwing it out there for fun. (laughs) But that, okay, but that is, so many things happening here in my head. One, for all that I think everyone, you know, who wants to should write mythological retellings. I absolutely love talking to classicists who have written mythological retellings, (laughs) because I think that there is a deeper level of nerdery afoot. Uh, Like talking to you is like being in my brain when I've been working on my current novel you know of just oh my god i found this super cool ridiculously niche like absurdly niche historical fact and Mm -hmm. i get to write it in and will anybody really know what i've done probably not but i'll know you know like 
I love that. Like there is definitely a different level with, with like just the, the depth of like ancient source nerdery. Um, and nerdery is an official word I will say. Um, <laughs> but also like, uh, where was the other thought? I think it was mostly that, like, I just, I, I love that. Like, that's so interesting. Oh, but that's what was the other thought is that you like, that's the great thing about novels is that you can take this historical thing and you can write it into yours and like make it what you want. And so you're like, yeah, I'm, you're blending this like really accurate niche historical detail with your own story in this really unique and creative way. <sighs> you're going to be excited for my own novel. Thank you. I'm already taking notes. <laughs> That's so great. And I was, I was even more excited because Sophocles himself backed me up. So I was like, thank God yeah. Sophocles. So during school, I read Oedipus the King and Antigone more times than I can count, but I had never read Oedipus of Colonus. I read it the first time when I was researching this book. Yeah, I've never read it either, and I've read the other two. Okay, so is yeah. Mimi has more of a role in that book than she does in any other. Um, so it starts with Oedipus and Antigone are kind of wandering around. Um, you know those images that we have of um Antigone leading him around and he's got his hand on her shoulder yeah. so they're traveling and she says oh somebody's riding toward us there's a there's a rider and they're coming straight this way oh my god it's Ismene it's my sister so then you find out that Ismene she secretly leaves the palace to bring news to Oedipus and Antigone and the news she brings is oracles specifically about him so I'm like okay Sophocles set this up for me what if she was making the oracles herself so that's that's where I went, and I and I just took off from there. That is the most satisfying thing to find, though. Like, yeah. Oh, I have such similar things, like it, it, not direct examples coming to mind, but I know that feeling so well of like having this idea, being really excited about it, and then finding a source where you're like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> like I was right. It works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I can back it up. I don't even have to totally fake it. Like I can back it up. Oh, mm -hmm. that's so fun. Also, so cool that, like, I mean, obviously the plays always feature, you know, more women than, than like, a lot of other kind of content. But, like, I love that for something about her riding a horse and being by herself yeah. really stands out to me. Being like, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm a woman. I am, like, doing this. Tell my family. Like, that's badass. And Sophocles says a very unsophoclean thing to me, where <laughs> Oedipus says to his two daughters that they're more like, they have more agency than their brothers because they go out and they do things, whereas their brothers sit at home and wait for things to happen. And I thought, <laughs> this is amazing. This is this is proof that I, that she can leave the palace and go on this adventure. So I was like, thank you, Sophocles. <laughs> yes. I do think that's the thing that, though, the difference, I would say, between anybody, a, just a general nerd writing versus people who are as steeped in the ancient sources, is that I also think people like us feel like we need that. Yeah. <laughs> where, where we need we validation. Don't. Yeah, like, we, you can fictionalize anything. You you can write anything you want into your novel. But I totally also know that feeling of being like, no, this, I can do this because Sophocles said I could. Where you're like, you could have done it anyway. But no, no. <laughs> I needed him. <laughs> I um in 2018 I went to a book signing and got to talk to Madeline Miller while she signed my book and I said look I'm writing this book and like you I did my my master's in classics and how do you get past thinking about your professors reading the book she goes I had the same problem just don't make it as good as you can and don't tell them about it until it's already out and I said okay <laughs> that's a good plan so I, I have all these ghosts over my shoulder, like all my professors and Sophocles and Euripides are like, you can't do that. But I'm like, screw it. I'm going to write what I want. Euripides would never tell you you can't do that. You know what? You're right. Euripides is a better, it's yeah. a better man. He knows that you can do whatever you want. You can make it wild and he loves you for it. <laughs> you know what? He was, he was part of my, my aha moment where I was like, it doesn't have to be super historical. It doesn't have to be true to the sources because there is no original source. Like myths are always evolving. They're always changing. That's what is so wonderful about them um, because they're always changing the story because of who's telling them. So I was like, Euripides is also blessing me to do what I want. So here we go. <laughs> I mean, he made Helen an Eidolon and, and he made Iphigenia like a 
priestess of Artemis killing people in Taurus. Like, you know, he he knows it. He mm-hmm. he's like, I did whatever the fuck I want. Why can't you? Like, yeah. that's the thing. I think I think people forget or or just it's not brought to attention. I think enough if you're not in really in deep in this realm. Like, if you're just picking up any of these books, like, it's so easy to to think about a quote unquote original myth or or to even think that like you know, that, that say Oedipus the King is, you know, the sort of formative, like the version of Oedipus because it's the one that everyone thinks about. Mm-hmm. But like, I mean, not only is it just a play, but it, it's like, it, it is, I mean, in like in being a play, it is fan fiction. Like it is yes. Sophocles working with whatever he had and writing the story that he wanted to write just like anyone else. And that is so interesting. And like, that's why I love plays because they are from the ancient world, but at the same time, they are reception, just like your novel is reception. And so you get to look at them in that way. And it's, yeah, like, it's so much more interesting to see them that way. And then, and then like, I think it's much more inspirational too, to, to like people writing. Yeah. And I think it's, it's more worthwhile to not try to just say the same thing like I was before as Sophocles and Mm -hmm. Uh, Stacia said but just to take what they wrote and try to make it relevant to me so yeah that's what I did yeah I love that like did you so did you play a lot with her relationship with Antigone or were you just kind of like Antigone's been done (laughs) okay so this is it annoys me but in my head is Meanie is basically me like she's just this shy girl and she kind of gets out of her comfort zone and tries to to make things right Antigone I'm writing I and I just write things that I have didn't think about it's like she's talking through me and I'm like oh my god like she really surprises me the way that she interacts because my Antigone is very aware that this should be her story, so she's kind of resentful <laughs> that Ismini is the main character. They even have a discussion at the end where she says, you know, I, I would have thought you would be the one that was left behind, not me. <laughs> so I just I just had like a first she goes through the you know, the five stages, like she denies that she's not the main character and then she comes to accept it and she helps Ismini on her journey. Basically. <laughs> That feels so Antigone, like, just so yeah. completely. I mean, it's Sophocles' fault, uh, but it does feel, yeah, very, very Antigone. I love that. Did you read The Phoenician Women for this? I, I did. That. I did, and I read, um, oh, what's the other one called? What? The Eurus Aeschylus Thieves. one. Oh, the East- oh, Seven Against Thieves. Yeah, the, I read those two as well, but um, I hadn't read them as many times as, as Sophocles, so that's the one that really stuck yeah. out in my head. Yeah. But even no, just fair, yeah. those three contemporary sort of like Sophocles, Euripides, and Aeschylus, they write so many different versions of the same stories. So I was like, it doesn't matter what I do because they've already set up this precedent of changing myths, so I'm going to keep going with that. Well, it reminds me, so I, I've had a conversation that has not aired yet, but will have aired by the time this one airs. Oh, it's, a, it's inceptioning. Um, <laughs> but, oh, but this part did not appear in it because it's for a future conversation. Anyway, basically, I have this, this plan uh, for, for future episode series, probably not until next summer, so it's ages away, but I'm going to just, something new and different for me, I'm just going to do Euripides. Um, but I want to look at like him more as a person and like how it all happened. And and um, I was speaking to to talk marshall um who's going to be on to talk about just theater broadly but he made some comments about Euripides that made me go okay you're coming back on the show like later when we're doing this because i'm gonna forget the details but there's this whole you know kind of tradition around around these these stories and and like what we accept as sort of you know facts and truth and original myth like we were saying and you know mm-hmm. and it is sophocles is right like sophocles is oedipus the king is like sort of the definitive oedipus i mean it's mostly because it's the one that survives. Um, mm-hmm. But like, why is it the one that survives? And so, you know, cause Oedipus or not Oedipus, <laughs> Euripides also wrote an Oedipus. And I forget what the detail was, but Toph told me that like, basically there was like, he had written in this like very big difference to Sophocles is like, I don't know if it was like Oedipus didn't bl- bind himself or some, some big change that, you know, just kind of his version and this change, like all just kind of got, forgotten completely um and and i just think that's it's so interesting to to think about like 
how these versions become canon because yeah. like no one in the ancient world was like Sophocles is more correct than Euripides like they were probably like we like this play better but they weren't out there being like this is the wrong myth because they understood how myth worked in a way that it's harder for us now mm-hmm. but I just yeah I love that idea like I'm not even forming this into a relation to your book I realize but like I just I, I think it's so interesting but I also think it does lend itself to fiction broadly right like 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 you were saying, there is no right or wrong myth. There is no original myth. There is no like, I mean, there are some things where you're like, that has no basis in myth, <laughs> sure. Yeah. But there is no like, you know, wrong version in terms of like the things that do survive. It's just so fun. I'm just now I'm just like so full of like ancient source thoughts in my brain. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure how it was in Greece, but in ancient Rome, part of a Roman boy's education um, was um, in oratory and in law would be doing these practice speeches where you would take a mythological subject and you would try to argue it from one character's point of view or the other. So you could try to be... um, defend Helen's actions or you could defend um, Paris's actions and it yeah. and the points that you got or the way you kind of revolutionize the myth and not sticking to like a current story huh. so even the ancients were taught like myths are fluid you can change them to to get what you want out of them basically yes oh I love that that's really interesting it makes mm-hmm. me think of Ovid you know like yeah like, like you know, he went and he he took all these predominantly greek stories and he was like i'm gonna kind of mess with with things and like we are still paying the price in a lot of ways like i think purely of medusa um it's this really common idea that that ovid's version is like the medusa now Mm -hmm. and it bums me out like i really like to stick to the i mean i love ovid but like something about medusa i'm like i want the greek i mean a big part of it is that like ovid introduced this athena villain story that i think is so unnecessary and, and like that's stuck in this way where people are like either you know Athena is the villain or they're like oh but maybe Athena blessed her and saved her and I'm like I don't like that either no. like it's all gross to me in a in a modern context I love Ovid for what he did but I hate that the people have like latched onto this as like this is Medusa's story because I'm like it is objectively not like if we're really talking about ancient sources the Romans were out here making wild changes and that's such a great example that 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 young Roman boys were taught that like fuck with the myth and, and you can like win at this, at this contest. Like that's so interesting. And it, it so screams Ovid, which is a great source, but like, not if we're talking about ain't Greek myths, then it's not. <laughs> it's funny you say that. Cause I only, I basically figured that out because I was doing my graduate research on Ovid. So I like had to write this really big research paper. It wasn't a thesis We didn't do a thesis-based MA. It was course-based. And in between the two years, you did a major research paper. So mine was on Ovid and particularly on um, book 13 of the Metamorphoses. But I wanted to talk about like his early life and his Mm -hmm. education. So Ovid's father, I think, was a lawyer and he wanted Ovid to be a lawyer as well. So he did have that training in in that schooling. So he was used to and trained to twist those myths. So that's something that people should keep in mind. He's not telling us this concrete myth. He's, he's telling us what he wants to. Yeah. And I, it's, I love him because I think that that, that's absolutely valid. But what I hate is when people are like, but that's the version. I'm like, no, no, that's Ovid's version. Yeah, that is Ovid's version. And there's nothing wrong with Ovid's version, but it's not like it's not the greek version objectively speaking mm-hmm. <laughs> for a lot of reasons <laughs> yeah it, that's that's so interesting to know that i love that fact yeah Um, without me having a specific question, like, were, what are some fun things that you, that you like learned about or that you wanted to write into this book or like, I don't know, I just want to hear more. Uh, but my brain is not coming up with a specific question to ask you. you have thoughts? Right. So, um, <laughs> I really got off on a tangent about the oracle of Ismene. Uh, oh, yeah. Ismene and Paula. Where we started? <laughs> yeah, but... Um, Neurodivergence talking <laughs> together. Exactly. 
Um, but I, I became a bit obsessed with that. I, I get, I lose focus a lot. So by, by becoming hyper focused on other things. Uh huh. Yeah, same. <laughs> so I, I did some research and I found out there is a school in the states that is currently doing an excavation on the. Uh, <sighs> the temple so i found out who was doing it and i emailed them i was like i like to ask you some questions can we like hop on zoom so i had a little zoom meeting with them and then because their research isn't published yet they weren't actually allowed to talk about their research but they um gave me some really good uh primary sources to look to mm. so um pausanias has like his you know his travel guide to ancient greece him. and he talks about thieves and the the temple so that was really helpful because the temple does make it an appearance at the end of the book yeah. um but um they told me about a book that i i'll have to type it out and send it to you because i cannot spell it for the life of me without looking at a reference Where's but there book? is a classicist name Sarantis Simeon Oglu who wrote a topography of thieves it's this massive book that covers thieves from um the bronze age up until like modern thieves like in the 80s or the 90s so you see how the city grows over time and you learn about the history and the geography and the politics and it's just such a great resource to have especially if you you're looking at thieves in particular so i was i was obsessed with that book i took it out of um, the special collections library at the university and i had it in my room for like three months because i didn't want to let it go it was so helpful oh i love that I love finding stuff like that. I mean, and just Pausanias is so fun and helpful for like mm-hmm. those little things of like just just describing a thing. Like, sure, he's late, whatever, but he's like the eyes on the ground in a way that we don't have otherwise. Like, thank fuck for Pausanias. Yeah, and even though he's he's seeing these things so much later than we want to write about them, it is nice to have like a, a firsthand account of what it would look like in situ kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um what? And it's better than nothing. <laughs> it is better than nothing. Exactly. <laughs> it gives you an idea. Um, another thing that was helpful for me, um, I know not, not everybody's in the position to do it, but my um, my husband got uh, funding to go to Greece and I went with him. And, um, oh, shucks. Oh, it was great. <laughs> he was studying these um, stone tablets at Delphi. So he was in like the archives looking oh, cool. at them and I was just wandering around. And I took a lot of um, inspiration just from being at Delphi for the book. And um, especially uh, there's certain um, artifacts that I saw there that are in the book and that are important. So when Ismini looks into like the fire and has her little, her visions, she sees these um, images speaking to her um, images that she saw on the sacred way. So we've got, um, you know, the, the famous Naxian Sphinx. Um, I wrote this scene where the Sphinx kind of shakes off the marble and becomes the actual Sphinx and flies down to talk to her. And um, there's also the statues of Cleobus and Beaton. You know, those, the two, the two, um, they're kind of like two Kuroi standing together. Yeah, I was going to say they're like really archaic stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they they were a dedication um, to the Sacred Way, but for the purposes of my book, they're actually uh, Atreus and Thyestes. <laughs> and then there's this monumental cauldron. And when I saw, I'm like, that's where uh, Tantalus stewed Pelops because it's enormous. So I had that cauldron kind of hops over because it has lion's feet and uh, tries to like swallow her whole. So I kind of took inspiration from things that I saw while I was there. So. You can find a lot of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. But I also love like what you're describing that like one of the things I think that it also I feel like should be in more retellings is more of that fantasy. Like (laughs) Greek mythology when you're writing it that way like is fantasy. And I think a lot of people want to make it real and really down to earth and I respect that entirely. I personally want the fantasy. Like I want the gods interacting with shit. I want like wild stuff happening. Like I also just love the idea that you that you had Atreus cook a couple of children at Delphi. Like that's a, another level to the crime that you're adding in a way that I respect it. <laughs> yeah, he he did some stuff and <laughs> <laughs> he did some stuff. <laughs> I I really wanted because 
I was thinking about when I was a kid and I was into Greek mythology because of Hercules. I was it was the magic that I was into. Yes. So I'm trying to make this as as magical as I can. And there's one part where I thought I went too far, and I'll tell you about it. So she's been traveling across Greece for um for weeks. She's she's dirty and scrum like she's got dirty clothes on. She's in she's cut her hair off to be a boy. And um, her and Apollo are getting ready to return to Thebes so she can have her, her big um, her big moment in the in the palace with the rest of the Thebians. And Apollo says to her, you can't go back to Thebes looking like that. And he kind of makes her look like a princess again. And and as I was writing it, I thought, you can't do this. Apollo isn't a fairy godmother. Like, this is stupid. Why not? And then I remembered, Liv, I actually have a precedent for this in Homer when, um, in the Odyssey, when uh, Nausicaa finds Odysseus, when she's playing with her friends, Athena makes him look more beautiful to her. So I was like, okay, I have a precedent for this. So Apollo is just as much of a fairy godmother as Athena was to Odysseus. So there I was taking my inspiration from the ancients again. (laughs) Yeah, so yeah, you had a precedent. You found the precedent in Athena. Um, I love that because also, like, it, it just you, you even saying that, I got so many other memories of the Odyssey because, like, there's so many moments where Athena comes in and she's like, I'm going to make you look a totally different way because cause it's like, yeah. yeah, for Nausicaa, it's, you know, she wants him to be beautiful. When he goes home to Ithaca, he's got to be a beggar. man. Yeah. yeah. There's so many different things like that. And I'm just wondering, like, I imagine the Iliad must have some of those as well. Um, But yeah, I love that. Like, I mean, the gods really can do whatever you want them to do. Yeah. And for the gods, like humans are their playthings, kind of. So that's how all Greek myth retellings should see it. (laughs) Thank you. So basically in that moment, she's a Barbie doll for Apollo. (laughs) (laughs) I love this because I... Like I've been working on a totally new novel this year, um, and Apollo is my absolute villain. Like he is the worst of them. He so is I, like, the I, worst. <laughs> he is absolutely the worst. But I do like seeing. Like I mean, that's the other thing about Greek myth is that like it, it, the gods contain multitudes. Like it, they are so often the fucking worst to some people, and then really lovely to another. So there's just you know it, it all checks out. Like whatever you or anybody else wants to write with these gods like it, you can probably make it work like they're really you know they are just so many things at once and that's why they're fun there's a scene like it happened i didn't plan on taking to say this she just said this of her own volition where ismini reveals to her she's been hearing this voice in her head and it's apollo and that he wants her to go to delphi and it's meaning sorry not as me and Tigany says to her think when has a god being interested in a human ever ended up a good thing for the human you have to be careful and it's meaning never thought that before so i was like okay antigone thank you for for putting that out there for her yeah and it's so valid and like i mean that that is the thing i love about greek myth is or and i that's what i want in my retellings it's what i've written into mine is that like yeah the gods are fucking dangerous like that is greek mythology in a nutshell the gods are dangerous. Their interactions with mortals rarely go well. Certainly, as we all know, like going to the Oracle in mythology, rarely a good idea. Mm-hmm. Some bad shit always happens. Um, and so, yeah, like I love that. I mean, and at the same time, like Apollo can be good to the people he wants to be good to. I cannot think of any examples off the top of my head, but I'm Sleepiest? sure they exist. <laughs> but, but didn't he like, comp- like set his mother on fire first? That's true. <laughs> like she was having after. an affair. But that's what that's what the uh, raven I said. Mean, but yeah, sure, sure, <laughs> raven. But you know, the gods they do what they want for their own reasons. So it's meaning it's like she realizes she has Apollo's favor, but she's very wary of like, okay, but when will I lose it? So yeah. I gotta be careful when I have these interactions with him. Yeah. Did you play with any of the other gods or is Apollo kind of your main one? Apollo's my main one. Athena makes a very brief appearance, but Apollo's basically the main one. Uh, Artemis comes into it and uh, the fates. I had fun writing the fates. They were great. (laughs) Did you, did you conflate them with the gray eye, like in Hercules? No, I didn't. I, I had, at first I wanted to, because it would have made more sense plot wise. And I was like, no, keep it, keep them separate. (laughs) 
I do. I mean, that's, I think one of my favorite like major changes to myth and characters is just that the gray eye and the moire get to be the same three crones in Hercules. Cause it's just so much better that they share an eye. <laughs> and even in that way, they kind of get conflated with the Norn from um, Norse mythology. Oh, do the they? three. Yeah. Cause there's, so they kind of conflate them with other myths as well. And I was like, cool. don't try not to do that. You've got enough myths to work with for this. <laughs> yeah, <fair. laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Okay. Now that I've said Disney's Hercules, uh, were you directly inspired by anything for, from Disney's Hercules? Or I don't even know. I'm just curious about the Hercules of it all. Cause I also love that movie a lot. I, I, I was inspired by, by Hercules because I wanted to approach the story with like, sort of Disney magic, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So I, I mentioned uh, Mulan a couple times. So like there's uh, parts of the book that I kind of thought of in regards to Disney movies, if that makes sense. So when she she uh, is drawn out of the women's quarters by Apollo and she heads into the city, I was thinking of, you know, Princess Jasmine when she puts on the disguise and she goes out. And when she disguises herself as a boy, I was thinking of Mulan. So I was just trying to really keep that sense of, like, wonder and storytelling that you get in the, the classic Disney movies. I love that. And I love that I can hear your cat. Right now. Yeah, he's greeting my husband who just came <laughs> in the door. <laughs> That's Cosmo's uh, podcast debut. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, like, but I love, like, mythology is magic, you know, mm-hmm. like, I, I, and I, I mean, I think those, those inspirations work really well, too. But really, like, mythology is magic. It is fantasy. And that's, that's definitely my favorite thing to have in these retellings is something that, like, really embraces that. Because, like, it, these weren't real people. And that's the fun. Like, that's yeah. the fun. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a lot of freedom to, to put on characteristics of people you know or uh characters you're familiar with to these uh, characters in myth and to flesh them out some more yeah Ooh, how much traveling in, in in greece did you do like i mean i feel like if i was writing something where I, people get to travel it would just be a shit show because i'd be like i want them to go literally everywhere and i have to think like logistically how possible <laughs> that is so i'm just curious like kind of if you had to hold yourself back or like what you wanted to do with that well we were only there for a couple of days um we were there um... oh i mean your character but i also want to hear oh. <laughs> about real life actually now that you say okay. it. <laughs> so she basically reenacts things that i did on my trip so this oh, yeah. was just me um reliving that trip but um so we were basically uh located in Athens for the majority of it and we did some day trips so we went to um Corinth and Mycenae uh we went to Delphi and um, Naplio and uh Thebes oh god that was the I best day of my life <laughs> I haven't been to Thebes I've been to all of the oh I haven't really been to Corinth I guess I've been through Corinth but like Oh, I'm jealous about Thebes. I once accidentally drove through Thebes, but we didn't know we were there until oh. we got to the sign that said you were leaving Theva. And I was like, son of a bitch. We would we just <laughs> like we I when I went there with um like my friends in ancient history, Fangirl, we we drove to Delphi and back and we took this like funny route back, whatever Google Maps gave us, and it took us like through this like very rural rig roundabout area and we're like mm-hmm. oh in a town and then I was like I'm curious where we are and then literally we go to the you know they do the like they have like a cross through the word to say you're leaving that town and I didn't realize we're in Thebes until it was just like yeah you're, goodbye <laughs> son of a bitch I was just here and we didn't have time to go back and so yeah oh my god so how was Thebes what did you see did you see the Cadmion I know that it's there's very little left I'm so curious about everything I did so uh Going to Thebes, we went on the train, and we thought like we got to the How the are station. Green trains? Oh, it was it was tough. <laughs> <laughs> when we got I to the station, green, wild. it's completely empty. There's nothing there but this like skeletal dog, and we're like, oh god, what have we gotten ourselves into? And then we just started to walk, and it's just everything looks so 
beautiful there. I was just, I, maybe it's just because I'm biased because I was so obsessed with thieves for so yeah. long at that point. But I was like, oh, this is amazing. And um, that scholar I had talked to who was um, excavating in Thebes, she said, oh, you really have to go to the new archaeological museum. It's amazing. And um, that's partially built on um, – part of the, the old cadmia so you can see part of it in um underneath and outside so i was just losing my mind we stayed there for hours just looking at everything and it was just so amazing to see all these like theban artifacts in thebes and it was just the greatest okay i've got to go to thebes next yeah time. you I have really to do. it's really amazing do. i'm gonna figure it out i've got to it's uh the problem is i travel all alone and like I like traveling, but there's some parts of Greek travel that I don't love doing alone. Like I did the bus to Naplio. Like the buses are fine. I'm probably like figure out the bus, probably to Thiva. Anyway, oh, I'm so jealous. That's I so fun. I wish I took a car because um the don't the drive. scholar this is my stupid issue. I don't either. <laughs> but Good, um, thank you. <laughs> this scholar Stephanie Larson, she said um, I really should go see the tombs of Oedipus. They are carved into the rock face itself because the the rock is very like malleable. And I was like, that's hardcore. I have to put that in the book. I didn't get to go to them, but just because she had talked about them, I, I had included it in the book. Yeah. But there's just so much to see there so you have to go sometime i am having ideas that are going to result in me texting my lovely assistant producer michaela after this um <laughs> that's so fucking fun i am so jealous uh okay i love that too because like the thing about basing your story in that part of the mainland is that there are there's so much close enough you know like yeah it, it really like you can access all of these these places and and have people traveling in this way that is like realistic but also you get to do you know Thebes and Delphi and kind of like whatever else in that sort of realm I oh Greece now I'm just oh <laughs> is, is there you know before we kind of like transition away from the the plot itself is there you know I don't know anything like one favorite moment that you want to share or just like I don't even just basically do you want to share anything more about the plot or your characters or just I don't know anything so I, I will share something um very quickly uh it's Not unexpected <laughs> unexpected fan favorite so I had more than one person talk to me about a certain character and I thought what because Ooh. they were kind of just there for for reasons <laughs> It's, it's so hard to explain it, but so Ismini and Antigone are kept in the women's quarters. They're told that they're kept there for their own good because the plague is ravaging the city and this is the safest place for them. And they're kind of kept under lock and key by their nurse, um, Pura. And Pura had a long history <laughs> in my head where she, she was not very um, good character in the first round of the book, but in the second round, she became a much more motherly character. And I had beta readers... Um, and my sisters were saying, what's, what's her story? She needs to do more. So she kind of became more of a central character through that second um, version of the story, just because so many people wanted to learn more about her. And even I was thinking about it, and it gave me an idea for a short story sometime, where a lot of, you know, Greek slaves were taken in war, and they were like, they weren't necessarily slaves before. Like Pura could have been a noble woman or a princess herself. So the relationship she has with the two girls is not so much as a jailer as like a mother with her children. And um, it's just interesting to like try to revisit her relationship with Pura, who was her only mother figure. So I have my beta readers to thank for that. So if we have readers out there who want to be writers and you don't always want to take your uh, beta readers feedback into account you should because there's a reason they're telling it to you so try to make it work well I also think too it's a great like I think the great kind of detail you added there is how is multiple people telling you that you know yeah. like I think yeah I, I mean if multiple people have told you a thing like probably it's a good idea to revisit for sure I have just had two people who've read my book 
be like, I think you should change this bit. And I'm like, fine, I yeah. guess I will. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, because yeah, I think, I think, you know, and, and within reason too, like, yeah. you know, and I think probably it was the same for you based on what you've just said. But like, for me, it was very like, well, I can see where you're coming from. I yeah. Kind of- you don't want to admit it, but they're right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Like, whereas if, if you had felt particularly strongly about a thing you could be like no no like that just doesn't work you know it's it's an interesting thing and and doesn't that just lead perfectly into what I think is so cool about what you've done and and what a lot of people do um is it like you just publish it yourself because it's yeah. working the traditional way and I think that's great and I think we're in this world where that is so much more possible than it used to be mm-hmm. yeah like I would love to hear how like your a little bit about your process and like what, you know, when you kind of were like, I'm just going to fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> that happened this year. I had, um, so I originally wrote the first draft 2017. Um, and by 2019, I made that decision to, to rewrite it completely. And I was finished the rewrites by 2021. So I had been querying it to agents from 2021 to um, early 2023. So when we last talked last March, I was still in the depths of querying. I had good responses, but people just didn't know how to sell it. And I thought, how can you not sell it when Greek myth retellings are so popular right now? And I don't want to sound big headed, but I know it's a good book. So I thought, Oh, should I? There's a lot of stigma with self-publishing, but it is really valid. And there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I was really fortunate that one of my co-workers um, self-publishes romance books. And she said, oh, just just go for it. This is the name of my editor. Why don't you reach out to her? And if she's interested, she'll work with you. And the editor was interested. She actually told me, Okay, so the the editor um, used to be obsessed with Percy Jackson and Greek mythology in high school, and she said it made her want to revisit all of her high school face. Was like, this is great. This is what I want. I want that high school audience and people to be excited about Greek myth. So I worked with them, and just at the point when we finished the edits, and I needed to find a cover artist. I um, entered this contest, so I was very lucky. There's this wonderful illustrator online named Holly Dunn, and she does um, illustrations for a lot of like the book subscription boxes, like Owl Crate and Aluma Crate. And she was running this contest where she would design um, a book cover for self-published artists. So I was like, "What the heck? I'll enter it in," and then I won. So I was I working that. with. So it was just um, a lot of. Um, luck and support from um, other women that got me to to self-publish this. So it was a nice little journey. <laughs> I love that so much. I really, I've gotten really into watching book talks over the past year. Oh, yeah. um, I like last year, I was like in a real depressive hole about this time. And I started reading a romanticy novel and then got into book talk has really introduced me to so many self-published authors. And I think a lot of people talk some shit and I think they're wrong. Like, yeah some of them actually could use an editor but clearly you paid for one so I'm sure yours is great. sometimes I read things and I'm like guys you need to cut this in half I would love to help <laughs> you but not actually do it um but I th- I do think that like by and large indie publishing is fucking cool and like mm-hmm. yeah it's just so different like because I went to publishing school like grad school for publishing but it was like you know 10 years ago and it, it, self-publishing was even more stigmatized and I think it's gotten a lot better and now it's like this idea of indie publishing more you know it's like yeah. you're just doing it for yourself and I just think that's great and I think book talk has made that really really possible and so like I just love that you did it like I think also you came to me at the right time when I was deep in my like book talk romantic tea times and <laughs> reading all of the crazy nonsense I read on there and I was like you should do it for yourself look at all these people who are doing it like it's so cool <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, it is so great that there's so many people that have so many success stories. And it gives you a lot more freedom because a lot of the traditional publishers are looking for certain things. So you can break out of the box. You can make, like, I read a book about a Minotaur milking farm. And that's exactly <laughs> what it sounds like, Liv. And, <laughs> and these are, and it, it was a good book. I enjoyed it. <laughs> so these things, like, you can, you have freedom to to write what you want. So even though a lot of agents were a bit hesitant to handle a story about a man who marries his mother, (laughs) I got it out here. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, 
I love that. I just love, I love the idea of being able to do it yourself. I love that you won a contest for it. Like how incredibly yeah. perfect to you. That must have felt like such a good sign. Like, yeah, it felt like destiny. Destiny plays yeah. a big part in the book. So I was like, okay, just go with it. Just go with it. Yeah. Like I, yeah, I just feel like that would feel like I'm doing the right thing. Like I made the right call, especially because like getting rejected by publishers and author and, and agents fucking sucks. That's a horrible mm-hmm. feeling and it can make you feel like it, the book isn't worth it. And I think, like you said, they are looking for a specific thing and it doesn't mean that the thing that you've written is not going to be popular. It's just that traditional publishing is like very specific. And I think that it's absolutely valuable. And like, I think that there's a place for both, Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like, it doesn't always fit. And maybe it's, maybe it's when your dad is also your, your brother, like who's to say. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I just, yeah, I I love that you did it yourself. And I think, I think that's really cool. And I know my listeners like to hear a lot about like the process behind writing, but also I think a lot of people try to write books and a lot of people feel discouraged. And the great thing about the world we live in now is you can do it yourself if you're Mm -hmm. so inclined. Yeah, it's a lot of hard work, but like you can do it. And um, the internet is a great place to to learn things and you can find people online that will help you. Like I met so many people through another podcast called 88 Cups of Tea, which was big in the writing community back in the day. And that's how I met so many of my beta readers. So like just reach out to your online friends. You can find people that will write with you and you can create your own writing circles so you can make it happen even if an agent's not listening <laughs> yeah yeah I just yeah I think that's really great and like especially as somebody who used to work in publishing and did the whole thing like it's so different now in such a great way like the the, the world is so much more open to everybody and especially when traditional publishing is like working they're working to catch up with a lot of things but they're so far behind on a lot of things Mm -hmm. you know and and so like sometimes you just have to go around them and that's cool too yeah and even though you self-publish a lot of self-published books are being picked up by traditional publishers now so it doesn't mean that you're just gonna be a self-published author forever even though that's not a bad thing like no there's a lot more freedom through self-publishing but there's a lot more um like you said, like some some self published authors can't afford to get an editor, but like if you're with the publishing house, you get that yeah. treatment. So that that's one of the advantages to traditional publishing. But like they both have their own merits, and um, it's just really great that so many more people are able to self publish things now. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think that's a perfect way to say to like, where can people find your book? Like, how is that working in that respect? And yeah, when is it available? This episode will come out, I think, after it's already been available, but you can tell me anyway and where they can buy right. it. <laughs> so it will be um, coming out January 30th, uh, 2024. It's currently up for pre-order on Amazon um, for Kindle and paperback. And I am trying to work out... Uh, ingram spark to get it in bookstores so hopefully you'll be able to get it through your bookstores as well but it's also there on amazon amazing now um from a completely personal standpoint have you considered kobo and also why not i don't know (laughs) great can i recommend that you consider kobo um not least because i know the woman who runs the entire canadian store and she's fucking lovely yeah like I just yeah it's it's so great that you're doing this I I really I was checking the date so this will come out um just looked at it and then I lost it when do I have you February 2nd so when this episode Perfect. comes out it'll be fresh and new and available and hopefully in stores and um and hopefully on Kobo as people will have lost a huge part of that conversation where I just uh, talked <laughs> about another option um but yeah like I just that's great I really yeah I hope I hope that it does super well I hope some of my listeners <laughs> pick it up uh, more Thebes, the better, but also like, yeah, more people doing it for themselves when, when the industry might let them down. So cool. <laughs> yeah. I hope people like it. I mean, that part's really scary. Yeah. I, but like, you, you don't, can't overthink it. So <laughs> you just got to hope for the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. This has been so much fun. Uh, what my listeners don't know is the number of times we stopped to talk about other random things that will get cut out uh, <laughs> because I divulged a lot of information that is not yet public. Um, but yeah, clearly this has been a true joy. Thank you so much for coming back on, Megan. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. This has just been such a great experience and I'm so happy to be on the podcast again. Well, I'm 
thrilled to have you and <laughs> thrilled to have your book in the world, um, especially uh, like after having dragged your poor episode out for so long before <laughs> I released it, hoping that I would do the Thebian and then realizing it's like 30 books long. And I was like, I am not prepared to do That's the all Thebian right. yet. <laughs> I'm glad to have you back. Uh, wonderful nerds. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Thank you to Megan for coming on the show and for sharing everything about her novel and, and the writing process, because I love that part so much. But for me, it's really interesting to hear it from another classicist, too, or, or just somebody who has studied classics, um, because when you have this level of absurd knowledge of the ancient world, I think it can be almost a hindrance sometimes, as you might have heard in some of those points, an obsession kind of with, with quote unquote accuracy in a thing that has no need for accuracy because mythology is mythology. So it's just like a unique experience chatting about that. And it was so much fun talking to Megan um, and also Thebes, you know, Thebes. So huge thank you and check out Riddles of the Sphinx uh, available at Kindle and now Kobo and, and uh, follow Megan. I've linked to some places in the episode's description. Enjoy. Thank you all so much for listening. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, my assistant producer. Laura Smith is the wonderful audio engineer and production assistant. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcasts Network. Listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby to help support the show. Can you tell I'm not reading my script this time? That was all from memory. I'm pretty good. Thank you all so much for listening. I am Liv, and I love this shit, particularly Thebes, because uh, Thebes. Thebes.